morning. How y'all doing? Good. Now they're all lying to each other. <clears throat> Go ahead and open up to Psalm 73. Today is the last sermon of the Faithful Anyway sermon series, and um, I've decided to uh, supplant Joey today, um, perhaps for your benefit, um, as we wrap up. So as you open up to Psalm 73, I have three questions that I want to ask you, and I want you to consider each of them individually before we read what Psalm 73 says. So here's the first question. Why does it seem that unbelievers are better off than us? Why does it seem that unbelievers are better off than those who do believe? Second question. What's our real incentive to be faithful anyways? Final question. How can we learn to stay obedient when God seems unfair? These are hard questions. These are questions that can dominate a lot of our lives and, and can control a lot of the way that we operate, can dictate the way that we think about things, it can, can manipulate our desires. They're hard questions, but they deserve to be answered. And Psalm 73 presents a lot of those questions in a way that is perhaps concerning to a lot of people, so that's why we're going to read it together and hopefully grow together as well. So join me in prayer before we dive into Psalm chapter 73. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for letting us come together in a place that we can be comfortable physically so that you can destroy us emotionally, that you can open us up spiritually, that you can break us mentally, that we'd be able to follow you better as we go back out into the world. God, we come here wanting to rejoice and to, get, to join together in fellowship and in worship. And I ask that as we dive into your word, your holy word, that it would speak into our hearts, that it would change who we are at our very core so that when we go back out into the world, we would live the life that you have presented for us. God, we love you and we praise you. Amen. Starting in verse 1 of Psalm 73, it says this, Truly, God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all of their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper. But what a difficult task it is. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. Then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail, and my spirit may grow weak. 
but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. There's a lot of times when we read Psalms, especially things from the Old Testament, that 99% of the sermon is just explaining all of the words that it uses. But I feel like today I could just kind of leave it there and move on because I feel like that one was, was fairly straightforward. It's drawing the dots between looking out at the world and looking at everything that's happening in our lives, saying that it seems like going out into the world, sleeping in on Sundays, not coming up to the church or joining a small group, not plugging in and serving, it seems like living and working a job and then retiring and having money to just spend would be the easy option. In fact, there's multiple times when Sunday morning arises and we're getting up and I've sat there thinking to myself, man, I could just go back to sleep. I could sleep in, have the day to myself, go about and, and do normal things, treat this like a normal day of the weekend and move on. Being unfaithful is the easy option. Choosing to, to live a life that's centered around ourselves is easy. It's easy to choose us. Right? And yet, the author of this psalm, Asaph, seems to be suggesting towards the end of his psalm that the right option, not necessarily the easy one, but the right option is that we would follow the Lord instead, that we would choose to lay aside ourselves and follow God, which is great. I think that's pretty straightforward throughout the majority of the Bible. We see that. And so that's not necessarily anything new. But I think there's something very unique about this psalm. Does anybody know what I, what I mean when I say the word testimony? No one. All right, so I'll explain it. A testimony, oh, Joe knows a testimony. Thank you, Joe. Joe knows a testimony. And Richard, okay, cool. So we got at least two people. A testimony is your story, but not just the story about you. It's a story in where you fit into, more importantly, God's story. Because as we recognize that this universe isn't built for us and this universe isn't centered around us, we recognize that we're part of something much, much bigger than ourselves. And it's not the American dream, and it's not the way that we fit into our workplace. It's not even our role in our family. As we recognize we fit into God's story, that's when we have a testimony. It's our story of recognizing that our lives are built for something much greater than our own desires. It's built to worship God. God created all of creation, and he allowed us a place in it so that we could learn to worship him. And in that way, we shape our testimony. We look at where we were. We look at how we came to know God. And then we look at where he's taken us since then. That is a testimony. Now as we learn to follow Christ and as we learn to accept that he is our salvation and that nothing we can do can change that or purchase it on our behalf, we get to do a lot of very unique, very fulfilling things. And as we continue to walk down this path and as we continue to follow the Lord, one of the things that he's very consistent on, and a lot of people tend to miss it, is that God doesn't expect perfection. If God per expected perfection, the majority of us would no longer be here on Sunday mornings and we'd be sleeping in. God doesn't want perfection. God wants progress. Progress is a result of faithfulness. Right? That's kind of how this whole thing works. We're saved on account of our faithfulness, not on account of our abilities. And in that same way, perfection does nothing for us. It's fruitless. But progress, that's something that even David regards as something of worth. Progress is something that shows that we are growing. and so it's some, It shows that we are pursuing God in our daily walks and in our daily lives. And that is the way that Asaph wrote this psalm. He wants us to recognize that it's understandable to have fears. It's understandable to have doubts and to have concerns. And it's more foolish to ignore them than it is to address them. But it's another thing entirely to get so wrapped up and so consumed in our concerns that we allow it to enthrall our lives. Because then we've allowed our fears of the world to become an idolatry regarding the world. Asaph writes this psalm in so fact of a testimony. He starts off looking at the way that life was. Then he comes to recognize that, oh God, you are so great that I've recognized that because I was so concerned about the sin out in the world, I forgot myself. 
because I was so afraid of how they were leaving such a prosperous life aside from you that I wasn't looking at how I was leading a foolish life. I wasn't following you. And then towards the end of the psalm, he wraps it back and he says, I was a fool for ignoring you. I was a fool for thinking I was following you when really I was just trying to be vindictive. But God, because of you, I have hope. Notice how at the beginning of the psalm he says, my feet were slipping. And at the end of the psalm he comes back to it and he says, but you are my firm rock upon which I stand. And in that same way we're going to look at our lives as we look back and we're going to say that our lives are shaped in this same way. But it's not always so simple, right? Sometimes it's not just we started away from Jesus, we came to know Jesus, and now we're walking with him and we're doing great ever since. Sometimes we're doing really good and sometimes we slip. Sometimes we're doing really good and sometimes we fall on our back and take a nap for a couple of weeks, months, years. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. We agreed we were lying to each other. We, we, we do perfect the whole time. But this is the way that Asaph shows this psalm. He wants us to have a change of perspective. He doesn't want us to just focus on the things of the world because if we focus on the things of the world, our eyes will stay there. And if we continue to keep our eyes on the things of the world, whether that be riches, whether that be success, whether that be the ideal family that we can post on our social medias, whether that be health, whether that be prosperity, whether that be our happiness, if we continue to focus on those things, we lose sight of what's truly important. Because just in the same way that God has shaped us for worship, He's not shaped us to live in a life of fear, but He has not shaped us to live only in happiness either. That's one of the things that's daunting and scary as a, for new believers especially is the the, that you have to recognize that we're not always going to be happy. Comfort is not guaranteed. But what is guaranteed is God's providence. God will provide for us and provide on our behalf and He will walk alongside us when we have burdens. So we have to shift our eyes away from the things of the world. But we can't lose sight of them either. Because if we lose sight of the things of the world, then we have no connection to the people of the world. And that's why we're here, right? We have that great commission in Matthew 28. And if we don't understand the people of the world, we can't understand how to share the gospel with them. But there's a difference from living in the world and living of the world. That's the way that Paul explains it. If we're living of the world, we're staying in that first part of our testimony. We're continuing to dwell in our sin and dwell in our past. But if we choose to remove ourselves from it, so that we can follow the Lord. And then we reach back and grab that other guy. So that he can reach back and grab that other guy. So that he can reach back and grab that other guy. Let me tell you something. One of the scariest things of being a Christian typically is evangelism, right? Sharing the gospel. But one of the easiest ways to do it is to do it with the people you used to sin with. Because they knew how you used to be. And they see you now and they say, oh, this person's completely changed. Nothing about them the same anymore. But if you reach back and say, hey, you're right. That's the way I used to be. I saw the fruits of my actions. But now I've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through whom I have salvation. And it's open for you as well. Jesus' door doesn't close on people because of the quantity of their actions or because of the quality of their actions. His door is open because he loves us. And he demonstrated that last weekend, right? Jesus died on the cross last week. He was raised from the grave to provide salvation for us. We all had a great time on Easter Sunday. Then we ate and ate too much food, and it was great. I just finished off the rest of my pie from Easter on Thursday. It was phenomenal. But I feel like, typically, after Easter ends, we tend to just kind of move past that idea and, and go back into our normal lives, right? You'll notice that this service is a little bit less full than it was last Sunday, right? At least I'm noticing it. Last Sunday, I don't know that we had an empty chair in the entire room, and now we've got plenty. And now schedules change. Some people were in town for Easter. Some people were out of town for Easter. That's not the point. I'm not preaching for the people who aren't here. I'm preaching for those of us who are here. I want us to recognize that Jesus, we, we put him up on the cross every Easter. He went up on the cross 2,000 years ago. We make sure we remember that he rose from the cross every Easter. But he's still alive today. His works are still working in us today. 
So if we leave Easter to last week and we come back to it in a year, we're going to miss out on a lot of gospel opportunities over the next 51 weeks. So we have to keep our head in the game and we have to shift our focus just in the same way that ASAP did. We can't keep our eyes on the world and continue to follow Christ. I mean, look back at verse 5. It says, They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. Asaph recognizes that the people out there, they revile the Lord. They might not know that they're doing it against God, but, I mean, realistically, those are the options. You're either doing it for God or you're not. And Asaph recognizes that that's the lifestyle that they've chosen. That's who they are. And that last little bit on verse 6, it says, They clothe themselves with cruelty. Asaph didn't know it. Paul maybe knew it. Maybe he didn't. But the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing here because he's drawing a comparison. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, it talks about the armor of God. Paul and Asaph work together here to draw something that's very, very unique. And I don't want us to miss it. Because Paul says that we are supposed to clothe ourselves with the armor of God, with the fruits of righteousness, with the fruits of faithfulness. And Asaph is saying that the world is clothed with cruelty, which draws a distinct difference. And so if the world is clothed with cruelty and their fruits are likewise, then we have to be clothed with righteousness and our fruits have to be likewise. We have to be righteous. We have to be faithful. We have to love our neighbor. Now in the case of Asaph, he recognized this in a way that showed him that the world was still cruel, but his God wasn't. And if that's the message that you need this morning, is that you need to recognize that yes, the world is horrible, but God is still there, well then there you go. But if you're in the boat of people and you're like, you know, I understand the world sucks, but right now I'm doing okay. That's kind of where I'm at. I've got a baby on the way. I'm feeling great. Graduation's right around the corner. My car currently works. Great things. Great things. But we can allow that mentality to shift the focus back to ourselves. If we continue to think, oh, my life is, I'm doing okay right now. That's great. But what about them? What about those who are out in the world? Succeeding or not, they're living in sin. They're continuing to store up things for themselves on this earth. And we know that that's not going to last. If we don't go out in our pain and in our sorrow or in our joy to share the gospel, who will? That's why it's so important that we recognize the distinction between what it means to live in the world and live of the world. We can't allow ourselves to be like these people and to wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. It continues in verse 8. It says, They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. That's like the high and mighty of the population. Right? This isn't the average individual. Maybe this is your boss. Maybe it's that rich person you saw on YouTube, what have you. But then in verse 10, it goes to the normal sinners. And it says, And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all of their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Now, there's something that's very astonishing about this section. When Asaph started this psalm, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about God's chosen people, the ones who know the word, right? And then here, he's still talking about Israel. And yet, it's these same Israelites that said, look at all these wicked people. They're pointing to their neighbors here. Enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. If Israel, God's chosen people, the ones who have seen God in the wilderness, the ones who God gave the Ten Commandments, the
the ones who God gave judges to defeat their enemies, the ones who God provided a promised land for, the ones who God, through God, provided prophets for, that he would write his inherent word. If those Israelites can fall away from the word, so can we, right? Oh, sorry, we're lying to each other. Hold on. No, surely we won't fall away like these foolish Israelites. So let's do better what they didn't do. And let's look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. And let's share the gospel with them. Whether that person is sitting next to you in this room, sitting next to you on the couch at home, whether that person's on your Facebook page, or whether that person is your cubicle neighbor at work, they need the gospel. And maybe you've tried. Maybe you sought out time after time to invite them on Easter Sunday, invite them to your small group. Maybe you've been praying for them quietly for years. Don't miss another opportunity. We don't know how much time is left on this earth. In fact, I was chatting with Marissa earlier this week as I'm kind of going through and planning how I wanted to attack this sermon, and she said she heard it from somewhere. So I'll just say that I heard it from her and make her sound smart. She said, time is like this. It's like a, like a sand hourglass, right? Everything on the bottom is everything we've gone through. It's our pain, our sorrows, our memories, good ones, bad ones, what have you. That's everything we've gone through. Everything at the top is everything that's yet to come. Now, we can't control what comes through at one point in time or another. We may have some ideas of what's there, but we're not quite sure. But in the middle, that finite, small little hole, that's us. We're going to watch as one grain of sand passes through after another. Some good, some bad. And we're going to continue to focus on those things unless we look down for too long or if we look up for too long. But if we continue to do one or the other, looking down or looking up, we're going to lose sight of what's currently happening. And in that same way, we can't change the past and we do not know how finite our future is. So we have to take advantage of the now. I've taken a lot of church history classes um, out of obligation, significantly more than choice. And one of the things that I've recognized is that the way that we as Christians, Catholics, and then later Protestants approach revelation is very unique. Now, I'm not going to take a significant time to make this point, and I'm not going to dive into all the fruits of revelation today. That is a conversation for a much different time. But there's been a very consistent understanding throughout church history that says when Jesus is coming, we need to be ready. That's pretty straightforward. But there seems to also be an understanding that goes along with it that says when the end times begin to roll, that's when we need to start sharing the gospel. We need to be doing it, sure, yeah, now, but it's going to be a lot more important when we see the times and see the signs showing up. And yet that's not what the Great Commission says. It doesn't say, share the gospel consistently, but then ramp it up right at the end. If we go back and look at Paul's ministry, he doesn't send out his letters and say, do okay for now, but make sure that you're right with God before you die. And make sure that you're sharing the gospel with people the last time you'll ever see them. He just says, share the gospel. He just says, do what the Lord says. He just says, follow his path. Now, the reason that we, just like all the generations prior to us, seek to have those little hidden ways of writing things off and getting them off of our conscience is because our conscience gets heavy really, really, really fast. Now, if our conscience gets heavy in the same way as Asaph, and and it's because we're looking at the world and we feel worse than them, if it's because we feel not as significant as them, if it's because we feel overlooked, or if it's because of sin, or it's because of missed opportunities, we can allow our conscience to hold us down. But again, that goes back to that sand hourglass. We're still looking at the bottom. We need to be looking at the middle. Because we know Jesus is coming. We know Jesus died and that he saved us. But he saved us to give us that now. He's giving us the opportunity to tell others about that salvation so that we can go out and share it with them. Not so that we can harbor it for ourselves, so we would share it and let it grow amongst the world. That's the way that we see Asaph's message shape over his testimony. Look at verse 13. 
Asaph's talking to himself here. It's kind of like a monologue. He says, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, sp spoken the same way as the other Israelites did, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Then, see, here's that transition, right? Asaph is recognizing that the world is hard, but now he's doing something about it. Verse 17, Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. Now, I have time to say this, so I will. We all have, like, like nightmares, right? And we all have, like, really, really, really weird dreams, right? Am I just the only one? Okay, I'll share this one. It's, it's really brief. This was probably two years ago. I was on a boat off the coast of Brazil with Chewbacca and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And we're watching this TV because they're holding a lottery to see who won this bucket of gold, right? And it was my friend Mitchell from kindergarten. He won the bucket of gold. But because it was my dream, it had to come back to me. So Mitchell's like, oh, thank you so much, but I didn't earn this, so you should give it to Tyler. And so they pan over, and there I am on my boat with Chewbacca and Bernie Sanders, and they give me the bucket of gold. And then Chewbacca swam back to Brazil because he was mad he didn't earn the money. And Bernie Sanders asked how I would feel if a vampire was in office. And then before I could answer, he left as well. So then with my bucket of gold, I went and bought the floating mountains of Pandora, and Marissa was frustrated I didn't use it to build an intercontinental highway from Kansas to Italy. And that's the way that the dream ended. You're welcome. Now, in that same way, it says, verse 20, When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. That's the way that God looks at our own toils. That's the way that God looks at the desires and devices of the world. He's given us all of creation. He's given us His holy word. And we're going out and trying to make it about us. When you put it into perspective like that, it kind of bites a little bit, doesn't it? Like a vampire in office. So we need to take advantage of it. So if today you're struggling with the questions that we started off with, if today you're struggling with a point of view like Asaph's was, and this question still holds heavy on your heart, how can we learn to stay obedient when God seems fair? I have two things that Asaph taught me, two things that the Bible has taught me that will be very, very helpful as we continue to move out of that and continue to share the gospel, as we continue to evangelize and disciple and to go to all nations in the name of Christ. And that first thing is prayer. You know, we pray all the time on Sundays. I prayed once earlier. I'll pray once here in a few minutes. And maybe you'll remember to pray sometime throughout the week. Maybe I'll remember to pray sometime throughout the week. We pray. But take advantage of the fact that God sees your life as that little dream. And sometimes your dream is normal. You get up in the morning of your dream and you go to work in the morning of your dream. And then you wake up and you actually have to go to work. Sometimes it's foolish, such as winning the pot of gold off the coast of Brazil with Chewbacca and Bernie Sanders. But genuinely pray. Pray that God would shift your point of view of the world. Pray that God would help your eyes to open and to shift away from the things that your eyes see, the things that your heart sees, the thing that your wallet and your pocketbook sees. Help your eyes to shift in a way that you recognize that the world is distraught. That it's destroyed and it's toiling in its own destruction and encouraging others to do likewise. Pray that God would open your eyes to show that the world needs salvation. 
And more than that, pray that God would heal your heart from the damage that you've allowed to happen to it. Pray that he would remove those idols from your sight, that you would be able to follow him anew, and that not only would you follow him in, within your own heart, but that you would encourage others to do likewise. The world is very good at encouraging worldly actions. So let's start getting better at encouraging churchly actions. And not just in a condemning way of, oh, you really shouldn't do that. You really shouldn't dress that way. No, no, no. Tell them that Jesus loves them. Tell them that even though they are in sin, Jesus still died for them. Pray that God would change you. Pray that God would use you for his own devices. That's when you'll begin to see change happen. Now, prayer is simple. Simple to do, simple to overlook, simple to forget about. So take advantage of it. And in addition to that, take advantage of the things that you have that will help you remember to pray, whether that's setting alarm on your phone, whether that's telling your significant other or your parents or your children to remind you to pray. Because if there's anything I remember growing up, one of ten, is that if you tell your younger kid that you want to play a video game with them later, they'll remember. Find people or things that can help you remember to pray. And then when that notification pops up, when that little voice pops up, do it with them or do it. Pray. Pray regularly. Daniel, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, was considered faithful because he prayed three times a day. That's a very inconsequentially small number. That's once per meal. If you only eat three meals a day. I have days where I eat like four or more. But if you only eat three meals a day, that's only once per meal. And if you can remember to eat three times a day, I'm just saying. The second thing that will help you out as you continue to seek to walk this path, as you continue to not only do that, but to encourage others to do likewise, is fellowship. Now, in the same way that you can remember to eat three times a day, and you'll begin to hopefully remember to pray more regularly, you need to engage in fellowship as well. You're here. That's step one. Step two is not booking it out the door as soon as service is over. Step three is chatting with people, getting out of your comfort zone to meet new people, to talk to people you don't know yet. As the church continues to grow, you're, you, you, you will not know people, and that's a good thing. So meet them. In addition to that, don't just do it on Sundays. Be like, hey, I really enjoyed getting to know you. Well, or more honestly, I don't really hear anything that you said because it's loud in the foyer, so let's get coffee and we can actually talk later. And then go out and get coffee or crepes or sandwiches or buffalo wild wings or what have you. Take time to fellowship, to meet with a fellow and build a ship, metaphorically. Take time to engage with other people, but not just on a surface level. The surface has to be where you start because otherwise you never build the house. You've got to break the surface. But once you get past that, keep going deeper with this person. Share your pains with them and share your successes. Share your heart. That's the way that fellowship is designed. As we go through and we see the New Testament, whether it's through Jesus and his disciples or whether it's through Paul or whether it's through the later letters or whether it's through John and Revelation, we see this idea of the church, right? And in fact... It's been said by a lot of smart pastors before me, so I'll be smarter by saying it. The New Testament was built with the idea that we are part of a church. And here we, we are doing a pretty decent job with that. Right? We are here in a building that is filled with the church, which would be us. That's great. That's a first step. But engaging in fellowship, doing things together, part of the congregation, doing things together outside of the congregation, whether that be small groups, whether that be evangelism, whether that be missions trips, whether that be game nights. Do things together. Because in that way, you're not surrounding yourself with the people of the world and being drawn back into that lifestyle. You're being surrounded by people who love you, people who care for you, people who love the gospel, and people who care about the gospel. If you surround yourself and engage in fellowship with those people, then your life, much like Asaph's, will begin to shift you will see a change. And that's where we need to begin, in prayer and in fellowship, that we would see the pain of the world and that we would let God change it through us. Now, that's a lot. It's a lot to do. 
I said a lot. So to start off, I'm going to help you off with that first step, and we're going to pray together. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for today. I thank you for your word, the inspired words that you gave us through Asaph. God, his life was much, much different than ours, and yet he saw the pain of the world. He was surrounded by the righteous. He saw the deceit. He saw the, the idolatry. He saw the brokenness. And God, I ask that you would help to open our eyes. As we go back into the world, as we are sent, help us to see their pain. Help us to see their brokenness. Help us to see that though they hide themselves behind a facade of money, of happiness, of joy, that they are dwelling in sin. God, help us to, to do this in a way that, that we would be able to evangelize to them. God, not just seeing their sin, but actively encouraging them to do something about it and praying and knowing that you will do something. God, you're the God that moves mountains. And if you can save sinners like us, you can save sinners like them. And God, I know you will. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.